I will um, be putting the uh, the first homework assignment. Up. Um, I should say that as you go through my book, if you uh, notice typos or things that are just really unclear, um, I would very much like to hear from you about it because if it's not clear, then you know I didn't do a good job writing it. Or it's not my friend, and if you point out uh, mistakes or make helpful suggestions, you will be immortalized forever in the preface. Uh, <laughs> did you guys all hear that? The immortalized forever part? Yeah, yeah we hear you. Or at least as long as print media lasts and civilization and things like that. We have this nice washcloth. <laughs> oh, and, they, and, and colored markers, great. So, um, screen test. Can those of you at remote locations uh, read this? Yes? <laughs> what about this? Not so good? Okay, good. No, that's good. Blue and black, that's fine. <coughs> So, you know, yes, uh, last Tuesday was sort of an overview of the entire course. And um, uh, I know there's people from a couple different backgrounds in this course. So when I, when I get to the point of talking about, for instance, why are some problems solvable in polynomial time, including a lot that the first time you look at them look as if they might take exponential time, so what sorts of clever techniques are there for skipping over the exhaustive search and zeroing in on the solution? Um, I'll try not to rely too much on the algorithms courses that um, folks from computer science have probably taken, So, and maybe you haven't taken them yet. So, But just to be clear, as a little poll, how many of you have already taken 561? OK, so all, most but not all. So um, I'll try to, I mean, when I get to the basic, you know, when I get to the overall ideas of divide and conquer algorithms and so on, I'll try to, you know, briefly review them. I'm not going to do that class inside this class, but I'll try to start them. So, um, but first we're going to start with uh, the, the simplest sort of computer imaginable, um, a finite state automaton. <laughs> And um, so, you know, these are really, I think, from, from my point of view, these are really toy models of computation. And some of what we'll learn from them will carry over when we start thinking about real computation by, you know, polynomial time programs and so on. Some of them won't. Um, and uh, so, but they have their own charms. So, um, what is a finite state automaton? So it's a little computer which accepts uh, an input string. Um, so there's an input with symbols in some finite alphabet, which is usually called capital sigma, not to be confused with sum. <coughs> And um, you will sometimes see, especially when you read Sipser's book, uh, the notation star. And star means the set of all finite words um, with symbols in sigma, or as people often say, over sigma. So for instance, if sigma is the two symbols alpha and beta, or sorry, A and B, then uh, I'll try to keep my use of Greek letters to a minimum and only use them when I'm trying to intimidate you. Um, so if you have A and B, then the set of all finite words over this alphabet is, well, first of all, we always include the empty word, the one with no symbols at all. That's usually written epsilon. And then the two words of length one, the four of length two, and so on. And it's an infinite set. It goes on to words of any length. OK? 
Okay, so it's just the set of all possible input strings that you could hand to a computer or a program that uses those symbols. Um, so what does our little machine do? So first I'm going to tell you about a deterministic finite state automaton. So how does it work? Um, so let me give you an example. So there'll be some special start state that we are initialized in. And then we will have um, some other states. And then we will have some transitions where, for instance, if I'm in the start state and I read an A, maybe I'll go back to that same state. If I read a B, perhaps I'll go over here. If I'm here and I read an A, I'll go back there. If I'm already in this state, I'll read another B. And I read another B, I'll go to this one. And if I read an A or a B, I'll stay in this one, which is the same as saying that once I'm there, I'll never leave. Okay. All right, so that's what the machine does. And it does this by reading the input from left to right. So for instance, this machine, if you show it this word, um, it will go A, B, A, B. And by the time it's finished reading the word, it will end up in this state. All right? So formally, um, we can define this as a function called the transition function. Um, you know, my style is not, I, I don't think this is a course about discrete math and formalism. So my style is to use formalism when I think it's illuminating. But in this case, um, I at least want to use the same notation that Sipser does so that reading Sipser will help. So we call this function delta for, I guess, delta meaning each little change. And what does delta do? Uh, well, let's call our finite set of states, the internal states of the machine, S. So it takes the current state, a, a pair consisting of the current state and the symbol. And after reading that symbol, it gives us the new state. <coughs> so I could write this out as a table, of course, and call these states 1, 2, and 3. And so, for instance, delta of 1, comma b would be 2. But it's kind of nicer just to draw these arrows and write the symbols on them. All right, so that's what the machine does when it reads this, when it reads this word from left to right. Well, and then at the, end of the t at the end of doing that, it's either going to say yes or no. Or as it's often called, it accepts the input or it rejects the input. So how are we going to do that? Well, there's going to be a subset, which Simpson likes to call f, but oh, I would really call it, I'd rather call it s sub yes. Okay. So these are the states where if it ends up in those states, it will say yes. And in this case, I'm going to say that here's the, here's the subset in which it will say yes. Okay. So as long as it's still in one of these two states, by the time it's done reading that input word, it will say, yes, I like this input. I accept this input. On the other hand, if it ends up in this state, and this automaton has the particular property that if it ever goes in this state, then it will never leave then it will say no. It will reject the input. Okay. So given this whole thing, which I will call M, and uh, let's see, I also should have said there is a start state S0. So subset, uh, a subset S sub yes, and a start state S naught, which is an element of S. Let's see. We, so we, and a transition function delta. So the whole thing is, you know, it's this whole bunch of things: the alphabet, the set of states, the initial state, the subset of states to which it says yes, and the transition function. Okay. So that's all the stuff you need to hand me if you want to tell me if you want to specify one of these machines. So after doing all this, I can define L of M as the set of words, the set of words in this input alphabet, 
that M accepts. Okay. L here stands for language, and this is for largely historical reasons. So this is, this is a branch of 1950s computer science in which people, especially some formal linguists um, uh, you know, around the, the Chomsky School of Linguistics, were starting to come up with little formal models of, of language. Um, after this one, we'll see one which is linguistically much more fun, called context-free languages. Um, but this is sort of the simplest imaginable one. And the idea is that what this machine is doing is it's reading this string from left to right and telling you whether it's grammatical somehow. Okay? And if it thinks the string is nonsense, it rejects. And if it likes it, it says it accepts and says yes. Okay. That's why that's why we have L. Um, and uh, so we'll talk more about the linguistics connection later. Here it's not very well motivated, but when we get to context-free grammars, it'll make, it'll be more fun and more interesting. Um, all right. So tell me in English um, or French if you say it very slowly. What <laughs> is L of M for this? What is the set of strings that it will accept? It's all strings that don't have two Bs in a row. Yes. It's all strings that don't have two Bs in a row. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Because, you know, if you like, this is the really happy state. This is the somewhat nervous state. <laughs> Every time you see a B, you get prepared to reject. If you see another B, you're like, forget it. I hate this word. Nothing you can say will ever make me like it again. Um, but if you see another A, it goes back to being happy. And um, it's OK if it ends with a B, as long as it didn't end with two Bs in a row. All right? So this is a pretty good example, because roughly speaking, finite state automata can, um, are capable of making deciding this kind of local property, right? So now I, I want you to think of this as a computation problem. I know it's a very simple computation problem. But so I hand you a string of A's and B's, and I ask you, are there two B's in a row? Well, I know that's not a hard problem. The, the point is that it's, it's such an easy problem that a machine with only a constant number of internal states okay, can solve this problem even when it reads the input from left to right, and it never gets to go back and look at any of the input before. So you can really think of this machine as a very simple little box. Um, it has pretty much one, maybe one and a half bits of internal memory. And you pull a tape through it with these A's and B's written on it. And you know it, it doesn't get to go back and look at any of the previous information. And it correctly answers this question, are there two Bs in a row? Okay. So that's a finite state of Um All right, well, let's try to figure out what machines of this type can do. So now what I mean is, when I say of this type, any finite set of states like this, OK? It has to be finite. And when I say finite, what I mean is that it doesn't get to get bigger in order to deal with longer words, right? So you know, in our introduction on Tuesday, we talked about problems that can be solved in polynomial time or with polynomial memory. So when I say that a problem can be solved with a polynomial amount of memory, what I mean is that if I ask you to solve an instance of size n, I'm going to give you n squared memory to do it. Okay? I'm going to let the memory grow larger and larger as I ask you to solve bigger and bigger problems. So, you know, physically it means, you know, I, I hand you a, another problem ten times as big and you say, gosh, I'd love to do this, but I need more disk space. And I say, okay, here's more disk space. And I'm happy as long as the disk space you need only grows polynomially, like n or n squared or n cubed, as a function of the size of the input I'm giving you. Here, this thing has to be fixed, finite. It has to be able to handle strings of any length with the same finite set of states. So um, over the next two days, we'll try to figure out what problems these can solve and what problems they just can't, no matter how big you make them.
And again, notice the distinction. I know that you, they could do pretty much anything if you let them get bigger and bigger and bigger to handle bi longer and longer strings. For that matter, you could make them bigger each time and just give them a complete list of all the strings they like. But that type of machine would then have to grow larger to handle larger strings. All right. So when I say make them as big as you like, as big as you like but a constant. Is that clear? Right. Um, so let's figure out, uh, first of all, a little bit more terminology. So now L, and remember what type of animal is L? It's a set of strings. It could be an infinite set. So in this case, it was the set, well, the empty word doesn't have any, doesn't have two Bs in a row. The empty word is just fine. We start at the starting state and do nothing, and that's one of our accepting states. And then there's A and B and A, 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 B, B, A, and A, 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 and so on. So uh, L is, it's an infinite set of words. Give it a question. Yeah, just uh, can we have uh, the same uh, machine multiple subsets? What would that What would that mean? What would What would they do? Multiple restrictions for a word like here. We don't have two Bs in a row and some other condition. That's a good question. Let's get to it in a moment. Um, okay. So if you have a set of words, L, a, a language. Okay. Think of it as all the grammatical sentences in your favorite language. There are longer and longer ones. Okay, so it's a sort of infinite set of sentences, each of which is finitely long. We will say L is regular. If it can be recognized by some finite state automaton M. In other words, if L is the set of words accepted by M for some M. Okay, so this is the set of languages that uh, there's some finite state automaton which accepts the words in that language and only those and rejects all others. Okay, if you'd like, it's the set of problems that machines of this type can solve where the problem is telling is, here's a string, is it in the language or not? And we just proved that the set of words with no two Bs in a row is a regular language. All right? Well, let's try to do something with all this uh, terminology. Let's prove a couple little theorems. So prove the following. If L is regular, then its complement is regular. In this case, the set of all words that do have two Bs in a row somewhere is regular. Prove that to me. Just prove the yes subset complement taken, yeah. Yes. The complement, <laughs> yes. I mean, just, just define the new accepting subset as the old, well, I mean, the complement of the old accepting subset, but, you know, all the states not in that. Okay? That was easy. Okay? So if, if this thing can tell when something is in language, it can tell when they're not. All right. Uh, maybe something a little more interesting, which gets to your question. Show that if L1 and L2 are regular, then so is their intersection. How am I going to do this? Intuitively, how would I do this? Yeah, run them, run them in parallel, and only accept if they both accept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, how would we say that mathematically? If we're going to run these two machines in parallel, um, if I have state space, if I have sets of states S1 and S2, how do I define a new combined state space S? Well, 
their union would mean that I'm sort of, I either have a state of machine one or a state of the other. I want the states of my combined machine to have a state of both machines. Cartesian product? Yeah, I want the product. I want, in other words, I want the set of pairs. Okay? Little s1 and little s2, where little s1 is in big s1 and little s2 is in big s2. All right. Well, yes, this is an exercise in formalism, but maybe a good one. So how do I define the transition function of this combined machine? Well, if the current state is the pair, little s1 and little s2, and the symbol I read is a, then the new state should be another, the product, the two rows, previous rows, s1 and a, s1 and a, and s2. Okay. Which is just a long-winded way of saying run them both at the same time. And then finally, the accepting subset should be what? Subset. What's a subset? Product of this. Yeah, it should be the set of pairs of states where, you know, both elements of the pair are accepting in their respective machines. Okay? Well, the machine is bigger. Yeah, much bigger. You know, yeah, the number of states is the product. If I, you know, if L1 needed a, if L1 needed a finite state automaton with 10 states and L2 needed 20 states, well, this combined machine needs 200 states. I'm not saying that that's the most efficient, but it works, and it's still a constant. So it's still a finite state automaton. Okay, what about the union? What's the fastest way you can prove that the union of two regular languages is regular? We just kind of complement. Yeah, well, there's two ways to do it. One is to do the same construction, but now accept if either machine accepts. And I guess the formal way to write that is S, yes, equals S, all of S1 cross S, yes, two, union with S, yes, one cross all of S2. But a faster way to prove it is to use de Morgan's rule, which is to say that, after all, the union is the complement of the intersections of the complements. And since we know that the complement of a regular language is regular and the intersection of two regular languages is regular, just apply those rules a couple of times and you see the union is. So this means, actually, that any Boolean combination of languages, you know, you could also take one and intersect it with the complement of the other and take the union of that with the third, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all these things are regular. Okay, good. Let's take another one, which isn't quite so obvious. So if I have two languages, let me define their concatenation as the set of words. Let's assume that they're both, they use the same alphabet. Okay, so the set of words of the form W1 concatenated with followed by W2, where W1 is in L1 and W2 is in L2. All right, I claim that if L1 and L2 are regular, then so is this concatenation. How would we do this? Yes, roughly speaking, what we want to do now is run these two things in serial instead of parallel. Run L1 and then run L2. And if L1 accepts, then start running L2 and make sure that it accepts. But how do we know when to stop running L1 and switch over to running L2? 
I can think of examples where it's obvious when to stop, right? I mean, for instance, suppose that L1 is the set of, um, is this thing with no two Bs in a row that we had before. Suppose L2, suppose I have a third symbol, which I'll call C, so now I have A, B, and C, and L2 is the set of words that form the letter C, followed by A's and B's with no two Bs in a row. Well, then when you hit the C, you know you should switch. But you can also maybe think of examples where you're running along, everything looks fine from the first machine's point of view, um, but you don't know. You may already have entered into what's effectively the second half of the word, the second part of the word. I'm not, these don't have to be half and half. But if you sort of switch at the wrong time, then you might get into trouble somehow. So let's put this aside for a moment and come back to it. So uh, it, it'll be true, but it's not totally obvious just yet. OK. Um, let's, let's just take another example. You might think that uh, you might think that the only thing which the only sort of thing which finite state automata can recognize are these really local conditions like you can't have two Bs in a row. I mean the thing about these really local conditions is that another way to solve them is if the thing is of length n, then um, hire n people, actually only n minus one and have each of them look at a little window two symbols wide. And if anybody sees two Bs, have them shout out, reject, and otherwise accept. So in drier terms, the point is that we could solve this problem almost instantly in parallel if we had a bunch of parallel processors that could all look at different parts of the word, then we could immediately combine all their results in a big OR gate, uh, or I guess actually a big AND gate, depending on what you mean by true and false. If they all say it's OK, then it's OK. If any of them say it's false, if any of them say reject, then we should reject. Well, but there are other languages which are not of this form, but which are still regular. So consider the following language um, that uh, between each pair of A's, there's an even number of B's. <coughs> okay. Well, this isn't quite as local a condition as not having two B's in a row, right? I mean, if you have a long string of B's, you have to figure out how long it is. So having a bunch of people where they each look at, at a little window it's not obvious that they could solve this problem quite so quickly, right? So I leave this as an exercise, but maybe you can already see that there's a finite state automaton, which isn't too hard to build, that recognizes this language. Um, and I'll leave for you as another exercise something which uh, was just on the comprehensive exam. I'm going to mention that every once in a while to try to you know, stir your interest. So what about symbols which are zeros and ones? And what about the language of uh, binary integers like, say, 3 and 6 and 9, uh, which represent integers which are divisible by 3? This, this is a more interesting exercise. So show that this language is regular. Show that you can read a binary string from left to right and with only a finite number of internal states. When you're all done reading it, you can say, depending on which internal state you're in, whether it's divisible by three or not. Okay. That one's a little bit less obvious. It's worth doing. And then once you do that, you know, think about divisible by 7 or 11 or 10 or 39. All right. Um, so
so the next thing I'd like to do is uh, define what's called a non-deterministic finite state automaton. And this was one of the early appearances of the notion of non-determinism in computer science. Um, so a non-deterministic <coughs> finite state automaton looks pretty much the same. So it has a, an accepting, uh, accepting subset, subsets and it has an initial state. But now, what, what was deterministic about the previous one? So I didn't quite say this, but the point is in the previous one, if you were at a particular state and you saw a particular symbol, there was only one place that you went. Okay. And that corresponded to the fact that there's, you know, there's one value of the function delta of your state and this input symbol. There's one new state. Okay. <clears throat> in terms of our diagrams, that meant that for every in every node of the diagram there was exactly one outgoing arrow for each uh, for each input symbol. Well, let's do something where a machine gets to make choices or guesses. So let's say that, um, let's consider the following thing. Uh, if you see a zero, you go, you stay here. Um, if you see a one, you can stay here if you want or you can go here, all right? And now let's say that, uh, let's say that if you see another one, and another one, that once you start, once you make that choice, after that you start this unavoidable cascade. Um, and let's say that uh, when you, let's see. Let's say that if along here you see a zero, then we'll go to a, a reject state, which can never be escaped. Okay. And let's say if you get here and you see another one, you stay put. And let's say that this one state is the only accepting state. So, S sub yes, or as Sipser calls it, F, is just this state. Everything else will reject. I know this is slightly complicated, but if you want, if you have a string and you want to end up in that accepting state, what do you have to hope for and what do you have to do? And you, you have to hope that it ends with at least three ones, but you also have to make the jump at the right moment, okay? And remember, you're reading the word from left to right, and you only get to read it once. So if it has, you know, if the word is 10101111, and you're happily going along here, but you get to this one and you stay here, well, yeah, now you, yeah, you're, depending on your point of view, you or the word or somebody is doomed, but you're, there's, there's, you, the word isn't going to get accepted now. Okay. So um, formally, a non-deterministic finite, finite state automaton is one where instead of the transition function being a function from state and symbol pairs to states, it's now a function from state and symbol pairs to the power set, the set of all subsets of states. So what this, in, this is just a fancy way of saying that this function can be multiple valued now. <coughs> there can be more than one place that you're allowed to go. Well now, how, how should we define 
I, I want to again define the set of words that these things will or can accept. Now, you know, I think when you first see this concept, you imagine some sort of probabilistic process here, like you flip a coin. And then we could think about, well, what's the probability that we get lucky and end up accepting? But the notion of non-determinism is actually kind of stranger than that. It says, we will say that the word is accepted if there's any possibility for it to be accepted. So um, W is accepted if there exists a computation path when reading W that ends in S of yes. Okay? So the point is that now, as we read this thing, there are multiple computation paths. Uh, going back to this example of 1010111, well, one of them goes 1010111. That's one path. Uh, I guess I should use my colors not, as long as I have them. Another one goes uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. That one also rejects. But then there's finally this accepting path, which, which goes 1, 0, 1, 0, and then at the right moment, jumps into this cascade and goes 1, 1, 1, and then the word ends and we accept. All right. So um, I just want to point out that if we had a large set of states, if you imagine some sort of coin flipping process, the actual probability that you find an accepting path and end in an accepting state could be quite small. Okay. But the notion of non-determinism isn't actually concerned with that. It just asks, does there exist an accepting path? And so this word would be in the language because there exists an accepting path, whereas you know, a word which does not have three ones in a row, there's no accepting path, so it would not be in the language. Yes? Do you have to have the zeros leading to the, the sink? Uh, that's a good point. So what I'm doing here is if the machine sees something that it doesn't like, I'm going into a reject state. Well, if we're saying that this function gives subsets, we could just let some of those subsets be empty. Right? So we could instead erase this reject state and say, look, if you're in this state and you see a zero, there is no legal transition to make, which means you're sunk. I mean, in that, it, it, then there simply are no legal computation paths from that point on once you're there. And so you're, you can't accept, at least not that way. For that matter, I could skip this one. Okay. This says that you have to land in this accepting state at exactly the right time, but that is possible as long as there are three things at the end, three ones at the end. All right. So, um, well, you know, this n instead of in front of the NFA is going to turn out in the end to be a lot like the n in NP. Um, I know that when I talked about NP and I did it informally and we'll do it much more carefully when we get to that point in the course, I said, oh, well, NP is the set of problems for which uh, solutions can be checked as opposed to found. And that is the, I think that is the best definition and it's the most modern one. But one of the early definitions was NP is the set of problems that can be solved non-deterministically in this funny sense by a program which can make choices and lucky guesses. And then we say, well, if there's any computation path that leads this program to say that the answer is yes, then the answer is yes. And the answer is only no if there's no such computation path. Well, so think about Hamiltonian path, right? So what does our non-deterministic program do? Really yeah, it just takes a walk. You know, it doesn't have to backtrack. It's a non-deterministic program. 
It takes a walk, and if the walk ends with having visited every vertex once, it says yes. So you could say search. Right. So somehow what's happening here is that in a very unphysical way, all the job of searching through all the possible paths is being packed into this non-determinism, into this if there exists. Okay. So it's saying if there exists a, a solution, in that case, a Hamiltonian path. Okay. So that's sort of the old-fashioned definition of NP. Um, and it, it's essentially the same idea as uh, the N in NFA. All right, well, so, um, you know, I spent a bunch of time yesterday trying to say that we really believe that NP is a bigger class than P. Well, what about deterministic versus non-deterministic finite state automata? It would appear that um, just as a non-deterministic program can, in some funny sense, try many things at once, and it gets credit for finding a solution if any of them work, we might think that a non-deterministic finite state automaton is more powerful uh, as, a, as a class than deterministic ones. That there are languages which are not regular, remember, that, that they can't be recognized by any deterministic finite state automaton, but which can be recognized by non-deterministic ones. All right. Well, that turns out not to be the case. In this case, down here at the level of finite state automata, these two types of machines, deterministic and non-deterministic, are equally powerful. Where by equally, I mean, if you can be recognized by something of constant size of this kind, you can be recognized by something of constant size of this kind. But the constant could be a lot bigger. Just as when we took intersections, we got things where we, we got the product of the number of states which is bigger, but still a constant. So um, perhaps someone who doesn't already know this could utter some intuitive comments about how I could simulate a non-deterministic fi finite state automaton with a deterministic one. Okay, so how do I simulate a machine which can make choices with a machine where every step is completely deterministic? And I'll give you as many states as you want to do it. Any ideas? Treat all, all the possibilities into a big state. Yeah, what you want, you want your deterministic machine to somehow have the information of all the places that the non-deterministic machine could be at that moment. Okay. Well, Does yes. Mean that it'd be exponentially larger than the non-deterministic. Indeed, it would. So, if we have an NFA with a state sta a state space S, I'm going to make a DFA whose state space is again the set of all subsets of S, the so-called power set. Okay. So at each moment, I'm going to keep track of all the places you could be. <coughs> and yes, the size of this is 2 to the size of that. If there are 1,000 states here, there are 2 to the 1,000 states here. A lot bigger, still a constant. Okay. Well, how should the transition function work? So here... Again, I have a state, uh, you know, given a state S and a symbol A, delta of S and A in the non-deterministic case returns an entire subset of the state space. So if here's, so here's my state space. And then after reading a symbol A, if here's all the places I could have been before, now there's a new set of places where I could be now. And maybe I could have gone from this one to any of these three if I had been there. From this one, I could have gone from here, here, or there. Maybe these would both have gone there. So how do I define this new state S, which should be the new subset returned by my deterministic thing 
given a subset, well, I'll call it R for reachable, right? So this is a state of my deterministic thing. It's an entire subset of the old state space. And given an input symbol, it should be the set of all states such that I know this is just a bit of formalism. At some level, you already know the answer, but let's write it out. Delta of SA is reachable. Say that again. So that S within, I guess, that substate has to be reachable from the delta of SA. Okay, so it has to be contained in, let's call this S prime. It has to be contained in S of A for some what? It has to be reachable from one of these, right? Yeah. So here's R. S is containing R. For some S in R. R reaches, okay. So if R is the set of places you could have been before, the set of places that you can be after reading A is the set of all the places you can get to by any of the allowed transitions from any of the places you could have been at before. I guess that's weird because it seems like R starts as a single state and then R is a set of states. Well, it's playing two roles. R is a subset of the state space of NFA, but it is a single state of this exponentially larger state space of the DFA. So it's playing two roles at once. And I'm defining the deterministic function, which takes you from the old subset of places you can be to the new subset of places you can be. There are lots of other ways to write this. Another would be the union over all S in R of delta of S comma A, keeping in mind that these deltas, the ones from the NFA, produce subsets. So, I mean, having some facility with this is good. So if this is confusing, quick, take good notes and write it all down. Look at it over the weekend. You know, once we get talking about P and NP completeness, a lot of our proofs, frankly, will be in pictures, and we won't always have to use this sort of formal notation. But I want to be able to use it without worrying that I'm leaving you behind. So play with it a little bit until it makes sense. Okay. So, oh, we need to, let's see. There's a couple more things we need to specify. What is the starting subset, the initial state of our DFA? Well, it has to be a set. Can the set contain only stuff in itself? Yes. Just the only place you can be at the beginning is S0, where S0 is the initial state of the NFA that we're trying to simulate. And then finally, what is S prime of, you know, what is the accepting set of subsets? So, in other words, after you do this deterministic simulation, how do you know whether the word is in the language? How do you know whether it is possible for the NFA to say yes? So any subset containing at least one of them. Yes. The set of all subsets contained in S such that there's any intersection. With the accepting set. Okay. All right. So, by the way, so the most important thing here is sort of the, you know, the human language description, right? We use formal notation to make sure that we really know what we're talking about because occasionally our intuitions are wrong. 
and as a, you know, a sort of international language of what we're saying and so on. It's, there are two different skills involved here, right? One is the skill of saying, well, we could simulate this deterministically by keeping track of all the places you could possibly be. And the set of all sets of places you could possibly be, well, it's exponentially, it, it's two to the number of states. Well, that's the core of the proof. And you know that's the skill that I really want you to have. But it's also good to have the skill of translating that and the accompanying machinery into formal terms. Those are two separate skills. So when I ask you for a solution in class, what I want to hear is the first part, right? And what you should want to hear from yourself is the first part, the intuition. I mean, um, a lot of people are nervous about doing proofs. Um, well, proofs are intuitions that you've made sure there aren't any holes in. So when you're trying to construct a proof, you should always start with your intuition. And you should say your intuition out loud. This is how real working mathematicians work. It's how real working theorists work. Unfortunately, when we actually publish our papers, sometimes there's been a deliberate attempt to obscure the thought process that led us to the final product. Um, and sometimes the final proof is written in such a way so that it's impossible to see how any, anyone would have come up with it. And if it's a really poorly written paper, the final proof is written in such a way so that it doesn't even say, here's the big idea, oh, and here's the technical details. Instead, it's all sort of mashed into this thing with a uniform density of symbols. And this is terrible. And people, you know, people who write papers like that should not be hired into academic jobs. And, um, and, and there's, regrettable, there's regrettable historical reasons for this. I mean, several hundred years ago, mathematicians did not actually feel a cultural obligation to explain their proofs to each other. They would just send each other letters saying, I proved it, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, and you know, then there's the fact that uh, I, I think that as a, you know, some branches of academia, uh, obfuscating your thought is regrettably given a positive incentive rather than a negative one because it makes you look too smart and so on. Anyway, the nice thing about computer science actually as a field is if you read good computer science papers, they tend to say, here's the deep idea. And then here's all the technical work we had to do to make the idea work. But um, a good paper in any field starts by telling you the deep idea. So remember this for when you write your thesis, for instance. Um, this also means that when I, uh, you know, when I or those I direct grade homeworks and exams, um, you know, what I really want to see and what will give you a ton of partial credit is the idea and um, not sort of long strings of symbols that are, you know, meant to demonstrate some sort of technical facility. All right, so uh, what should we do next? So these NFAs seem to be as powerful as DFAs. I mean, we, we've proved that. We've proved that you can simulate any NFA with a DFA. It's exponentially bigger, but if the size of the NFA, NFA was a constant, the size of the DFA is a bigger constant, but still a constant. Um, we've seen some examples of things that are regular, which, by the way, this now means that regular means you can be recognized by an NFA or a DFA. <coughs> um, let's use this new fact to prove this. Okay. <coughs> so now that we're free to use non-deterministic finite state automata instead of deterministic ones as our definition of what these can do, Maybe certain things will now be a lot easier to prove. Yeah, you don't have to make it right time. Just <laughs> exactly. So now we can guess when to switch from one machine to the other. And I leave the details to you. Okay. So the point is that you know, yeah, we're now we're going to have something where I have the diagram of of the first machine here. But you know, pretty much any time you want, you can switch over to the second machine. And as long as there's some time weird that you can switch over, well, now I'm giving you the answer. But tell you what, as an exercise, write it out in painfully exact formalism. You know, tell me what the 
tell me what the state space is, tell me what the delta is, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, in NFAs, it, it's sometimes handy to have uh, what people call epsilon transitions, uh, which means you get to go from this state to this state without reading anything at all. Sometimes that just makes drawing these diagrams a little bit easier, okay. as opposed to reading one symbol for every step. All right, so now we know that the intersection of regular languages is regular, the, uh, the concatenation of them is regular. Let me give one more thing like this to you. So let me introduce L star. Well, this is going to be, in spirit, the same star um, as the star when we say that this is the set of all finite words. What is that over an alphabet? Uh, sigma. What does that mean? It means there's either no symbols, or one symbol, or two symbols, or three symbols, etc. Similarly, L means um, the empty word, or any word in L, or the concatenation of L with itself, which does not mean a word in L which is repeated twice. It means a word followed by another word, both of which are in L. Okay. Or the concatenation of three words that are in L, and so on. Okay. I could call this L squared and L cubed. All right. So L star means the set of all words which can be broken up into a string of words, each of which is in L but with no restriction on how many of them there are. Okay. Well, as you can imagine, <coughs> and as I hope at this point you can prove, perhaps using non-determinism, if L is regular, then L star is regular. Okay. Again, you should feel free to use a non-deterministic finite state dominant to prove that. All right, well, so now that we know lots of things that are regular, including lots of ways to combine things, uh, other things that are regular, give me an example of a word which isn't regular. Uh, sorry, a language. Give me an, a set of words where no finite state automaton, deterministic or not, can correctly check whether an input is in this set or not. Give me a property of words so I mean the property of having two Bs in a row, it's easy to check with the finite state automaton. Give me a property of words which no finite state automaton can check. Don't worry about proving it yet, just give me one that you're pretty sure. Equal numbers of zeros and ones. Sure, yeah. So, so we'll say um, L is the set of all words. Let's keep using A's and B's. I don't know, there is multiplied to, um, such that the number of A's equals the number of B's. All right, well, intuitively, if you're reading such a word from left to right, I mean, what do you have to know at each point? Track of track. And count. count. Okay. Yeah, you have to be able to count. And you have to be able to count you know, specifically, I guess you need to be, keep track of the difference in the number of A's and B's so far. So here's one way you could do this. Every time you see an A, go this way. Every time you see a B, go that way. We start at zero, and we demand, and zero is the only accepting state. Well, this is all very nice, but. Yeah, I mean, this is an infinite state automaton. Yeah. So I think our intuition is pretty strong that you really need this infinite number of states. I mean, you really need to be able to count. If you could only count up to 100, and then you stuck at 100, or you cycled back down to zero, or whatever, well, you know, you're going to make mistakes. So let's try to take that intuition and turn it into a proof. So um, all right, so
so let's let's invent a bit more notation. Okay. Let's say that. So first of all, notice that now we're trying to prove something isn't regular. So should we be trying? Which would be easier to prove that it can't be recognized by a DFA or by an NFA? DFA. Yeah, well, DFAs DFA. seem weak. We know they're equivalent, but they're sort of a little weaker and a little easier to think about. So we get to use whichever one is easiest for our proof. So just as we used NFAs to prove that the concatenation of two regular languages is regular, now if we can prove that you can't be recognized by a DFA, well, that also means you can't be recognized by an NFA. But DFAs are sort of simpler, so it might be easier to use them for purposes of our proof. So. Suppose that I have a DFA. Um, so given a DFA, um, if W is a word, okay, define S sub W as the state you end up in after starting in the initial state and reading the word W. Okay, I mean, we could write this out in painful detail, but you know, you start with the initial state, you read the first symbol of W, then you read the second symbol of W, and so on. But it's what you—it's where you end up in the diagram after reading the symbols in W from left to right. So, okay, all right. Now, um, suppose a DFA M uh, recognizes the language L. Okay, so again, that's the set of states that the machine accepts. Well, first of all, notice that I can define this del this state S sub W as um, you know, uh, W doesn't have to be the whole word. It could be some initial segment of the word, right? Right. It could be where you got to at that point, and W is the first part of the word, and there's more to come. So now, suppose that I have two two words, U and V. Okay, and suppose. That, uh, oops. Suppose that reading them sends you to the same state. Okay? For some U and V and sigma. Okay. So I start with the initial state. I read U left to right. I end up somewhere. If I read V from left to right, starting with the initial state, I end up in exactly the same place. Well, suppose this were true. What can you tell me now about these words and, and the language? Well, for one thing, I mean, if, if, one of, if U is in the language, then V is too, right? Because either this state where they both end up in is an accepting state or a rejecting state. But there's more that we can say, right? So. If U is in the language, then if and only if V is in the language. But what else can we say? Nothing about the length, the length of these these two words. There's no all. I haven't made any assumptions about their length. Well, what happens if I now add some additional symbols, but the same symbols in both cases? Oh yeah. Okay. And it can contaminations with another. Right. So the point is, you know, reading U, here, here's S naught. Reading U brought us here, but reading V also brought us here. Doesn't matter. And now if I read something else, W, well, I'll end up in the same place in both cases. Yeah. It's a deterministic machine. I'm starting from the same place. I mean, the, the point is that the only thing the machine knows about the string is the state it's in. 
The state it's in represents the machine's entire knowledge about what it has read so far. And it reads the string from left to right, so there's no way it can go back and remember that U and V were not the same. As far as the machine knows, U and V <coughs> are identical, not just in the sense that if one is the language, so is the other, but no matter what we follow them with, we end up in the same state. Which means that if we tack any suffix, any additional string of symbols, we have to get the same result in both cases. All right. So the point is that if the machine only has a finite number of different states, then it classifies the set of all possible words into only a finite number of different types. Okay? I'm not talking about the final classification of does it accept or reject. I mean the state it's in after reading them. So let's define an equivalence relation. So we'll say that U and V are equivalent, U twiddle V. Um, if, uh, so I mean, this is a property of a machine, right? So right now we're asking, what can a machine do? So given a machine, let's say u twiddle v if s sub u equals s sub v. Okay. So what this means is that it breaks the entire world of strings finite strings of any length up into these blocks and the number of different blobs and the, the number of different equivalence classes is just the number of states. Let's go back and do an example with our first one. Okay. So here, here was our initial state and reading an A or a B, brought us back there, reading a B, took us to this slightly nervous state, reading another B, took us to the reject state that we can never leave. All right? So what I'm trying to say is, there's a set of words which reading brings you back here, there's another set of words which reading them you end up here, and there's a third set of words which reading them you end up here. Okay. So, this divides the entire universe of words up into just three groups. Okay? And more importantly, two words are equivalent if they end up in the same place, and the machine can never again tell the difference between them, no matter what happens from there on in. All right? Now prove to me that this language is not regular. Make three three ways the uh, three groups right. Let's uh -huh. how many groups you can make infinite. Right. So so prove to me that I need an infinite number of groups here. You can stop anywhere. You can end up at any point. That's true, but you're talking about this machine now. But now I want you to forget about the machine because maybe we're just not being clever enough. Maybe there's a different machine with only a finite number of states. So now I'm just focusing on this language. And I want to prove that no finite state machine can recognize this language. We can have something like 1a, 1b, 2b, 2a, and so on. So it's a lot of sets of uh, like correct words. Yes. So the uh, set of correct words is like several sets of correct words, like infinite number of that set. Well, <laughs> I, I hear you, yeah. But let's try to, you know, we have four minutes left. We can really <laughs> prove this. I mean, w under what circumstances do I know that two words must lead us to two different states? When they follow by 
same, I mean, post fix, they lead to different end state groups. Right. So, for instance, you know, A, right, A, B is in the language. There's an equal number of A's and B's. But A, A, B is not. Okay. Therefore, S sub A cannot be the same as S sub A, A. They have to be in different states. Yeah. But similarly, you know, S sub A, A, A has to be different from both of those. Okay. And so does S sub A, 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 and so on. You can use these two as well, but, well, any infinite set will do. So as soon as we can pick out an infinite set of things, which can't be the same in the machine's mind, because they can be followed by different things, because following them by the same things can lead one to can lead one of them to end up rejecting and the other accepting. Well, therefore, each of these has to be represented by a different, a different state. And indeed, right, these are the states we drew before, states representing the integers. So for instance, it's OK, actually. S sub A, B, A being the same as S sub A, well, that's OK. Those are equivalent because the, there's one more A than there is B. But, you know. So, so this is a nice way to prove that a language isn't regular. All you need to do is find an infinite set of words where no, no two of them are equivalent to each other, where equivalent means that they can be followed by the same things and end up being accepted. So to put this a little bit differently, let's say that um, u twiddle v if for all w you might have use that upside down a for for all it just saves a little bit of ink for all w u followed by w is in the language if and only if v followed by w is in the language so it turns out that um, uh, so there'll be you'll get to play with these concepts a little bit but if I give you a language and you figure out what the equivalence classes of this equivalence relation are, how this notion of equivalence divides or how it clumps words together, if there's a finite number of clumps, it's regular. And moreover, the smallest possible finite state automaton has exactly one state for each clump. But if there's an infinite number of clumps, then you need an infinite number of states. So it's not regular. Okay. All right. So um, the rhythm we're going to get into here is that uh, homeworks will be due on Thursdays. So I'm going to post a nice light beginning of the semester homework assignment, just an appetizer, and uh, which will be due on Thursday. And because the printing of my book took is taking longer than I meant it to, I'm going to post. I already posted the prologue on my web page. I'll post chapter one now on my web page. So you can get going and earn an acknowledgement in the preface. Um, so, and please, as you look at it, you know, don't just give me micro comments about, I think this semicolon should be a colon. I mean, tell me if you, you know, and don't butter me up either. But I, I really want to know if you think the explanations in there are, are good explanations and if the examples are good examples. Um, so, uh, and if it's clear. So, and, and there's no disincentive. If you read a part of my book and you think it's completely incomprehensible and you tell me so, it is not the case that I will make a black X in your name in my grade book because you're stupid. You know, I will thank you profusely and try to figure out how it can be made more clear. Okay. Good.